Hey everyone, it's Classic DM, and we're going to take a step back in time to before the village of Hamlet and before the Temple of Elemental Evil and continue our conversation about the, a new kind of adventure we're putting together called the Rise of Ayas. So let's just go ahead and jump right into it. So as you may remember from a previous video, we talked about how what we wanted to do is go back in time and go back before the Temple of Elemental Evil. We gave you a little history lesson, talked about what happened in the Hamlet, where the World of Greyhawk stuff was. We went through some history elements. You can check that video out and read the details, all that kind of stuff there. We walk you through all the story. It's like reading a Tolkien book almost. What we're going to do today is we're going to talk about our new story. And we're also going to introduce you to the cast of cool characters that we've created for this adventure that happens before the Village of Hamlet and before the Temple of Elemental Evil. And then following subsequent to that, we're going to actually show you and draw for you um, a map from the... We're going to take the original module and talk very briefly about what elements are in here that aren't even here. You know, there's some elements in the Village of Hamlet that aren't even built until after that massive Battle of Emirati Meadows actually happens. So we're going to talk about that because we need to change the landscape. Some of these things aren't here. So what we're going to do after that in another episode... Let's just get this bad boy out of the way. We've got a copy of the map that we just printed a little black and white version at uh, FedEx office, even though it's kind of blurry. And we're going to do some tracing paper on top of this. And we're going to redraw this whole cool map to show what was it like before the Village of Hama and before the Temple of Elemental Evil. And our campaign with our new character is going to take place here. So that's all the cool stuff we've got in store for you. And let's go ahead and get started because I know sometimes we get things can be a little long-winded and it can get a little detailed, right? So let's get into the real fun stuff here. So before we go too much further, right, let's just go back up here and give you a quick little overview of kind of what we're talking about. So real simply, you know, the mem it's all about the memories. You know, a lot of this AD&D video series I do, we played this stuff when we were kids. So you know, this is 45, 43 years ago. So the in the early memories of Hamlet, whether you're a late, you know, entry to the D&D or a new entry to D&D or whatever you are, you did when you're a kid and you can't play anymore, Hope you're going to find some fun nostalgia in here because here we go. Many have lived or heard the tales of the village of Hamlet, the moat house, and ultimately the temple of elemental evil. For many of the events, uh, the events in this central region of World of Greyhawk happened over 40 years ago, like me, right? And people my age. Those events came at a time of evil scattered and unorganized resurgence. So that's a really key part. We're going to go back in time before that when evil's not scattered and not unorganized. They're very nasty and very organized. So adventurers today look fondly upon these early days of heroism. The stories of how a small village with factions of the old religion and its druidic core and the followers of St. Cuthbert was the base of operation for jaunts into the ruins left by the great battles of armies of the past. Many faced the local evil and went on to clear the extensive dungeons of and elemental nodes of the temple elemental evil with its lethality still very much intact. Act. So in the beginning, if you ever go back and play these original old modules and you're playing through the moat house or you're playing ultimately in through the temple elemental evil or you're going to the church of St. Cuthbert or going to the, the guard tower, all these different kinds of places you can go check out and all these little things you can go do. You know, the end of the welcome winch is this awesome base of operations, all these different places and all these things you get to do. Well, some of those things weren't there originally. Some of those things weren't there at all. So what actually happened? So before all that, you had this battle. And I mentioned this in the last video. I kind of want to give you just a quick little one-page breakdown. So the memories came after Evil's power. Years before most had arrived and dealt the final blows to Zuck, Motoy, and even Ayas, there was horror and pestilence. So you have to kind of think like Eastern Plaguelands or Western Plaguelands or World of Warcraft or something in your memory like Mordor type of thing going on, right? The combined forces of men, elves, dwarves, the region fought and won the famous Battle of Emery Meadows under the leadership of the Prince Thrommel. And he's a key character. The Grand Marshal of Foriandi, which you see is a nation above the little, you know, battle marker we have on our map here, the big red splat, right, of blood. The Provost of Valuna, which is the you know, neighboring kingdom that he's partnered up with. Under his command, the combined forces of men, elves, dwarves, and of the region defeated the armies of evil along the banks of Velvadiva River and subsequently drove the horde back and sealed the Temple of Elemental Evil. So if you're Grey Harker and you're geeking out at this point, that's awesome. Love to hear you share your comments like, oh, me and my friends, we went and played this once and we changed it around and we did it this way. So some three years later, uh, this you know Prince Thrommel was kidnapped and they put his body in a black iron coffin deep in the one of the levels of the Temple of Elemental and as a show of their unwavering revenge, right? A little literary writing there, take it out. So what we're going to do is this. How about before that? 
how about before someone comes to the Temple of Elemental Evil and it's all sealed up and only the stuff's half occupied and sort of a scattered hodgepodge of some sort of okay evil? What happens if you take, you know, an experienced D&D player like me, uh, who isn't the best in the world, but experienced, right? And we create what it was like to be there before T1. What was it like to be there before the Temple of Elemental Evil? We take these little tidbits of history that we've got in the world of Greyhawk, and we say to ourselves, you know, before the Battle of Emerity Meadows, swarms of creatures worshipped and worked their wickedness as servants of the Temple of Elemental Evil and made a homlet and the lands for leagues around a mockery of freedom and beauty which is kind of verbatim words taken right out of the Village of Hamlet, page one overview. You read that player background, that's the kind of selling point. This box text here is what those players need to hear about. Because when you play the Village of Hamlet, they have to kind of tell you, like, what France was like when Hitler was here. You know, it's that kind of a vibe. So that's not really happening. But in our venture, we're going to talk about what happened before this, before this beautiful view of this tranquil little village, before you're running around this really cool map with the Druid of the Grove and the Church of St. Cuthbert and the end of the Welcome Winch. How lovely is that, right? So before all that happened, there's some nastiness going down. So this is the story of six heroes from different backgrounds, lives, and loyalties that came together and faced that evil at the height of its power. Their actions brought the forces of Voluna, Foryandi, Selene, the Cron Hills, the Gnarly Forest, and even the reclusive people from the highest mountains of the Lort Mills together changed the course of history but it wasn't easy. So that's our challenge. We're going to create and play this adventure with a cast of characters that we rolled up last weekend. Let's introduce you to them right off the bat. So right off the bat, I'm going to leave the map open here in the background so you can see what this looks like. Right off the bat, we're going to have it have a dwarf fighter. So what we did is we did this massive matrix of ability scores. We did this. We said we want six characters. We'll take six columns and six rows, and we'll do 46 and drop the lowest one. And we had some bad ability scores. As you can see, his charisma is seven. And we said to ourselves, okay, with those wacky ability scores, how can we create kind of a super group, even though they're level one? But let's make the group not totally perfect. It's not three clerics and three fighters. Let's put some gimp in there. And let's put some characters that don't have the best abilities in the world. Let's put some outlandish personalities in there, like you would see in Neverwinter Nights or Baldur's Gate or Icewind Dale some of the computer games we played over the years. So, you know, the first character we created is Orsta Ulviksen, you know, kind of a Norwegian kind of a vibe. And he's a dwarf fighter. He's from the Lort Mills Mountains. So you can see in the backdrop here to the left, this is massive, deep, orange, towering mountain range right to the west of the Kron Hills. So if you remember in the previous uh, video, the Kron Hills, as they were all filled with like 20,000 gnomes, right? So as the Kron Hills kind of butt up against the Lort Mill Mountains, and you can even see the little dotted trail that connects from Selene to the other side where the Grand March is. Somewhere through here, it's always alluded to this dwarves living here. Well, Orsta comes from there. So his he's a level one guy. He's got his splint mail and his small shield. He's just going to use a little dwarven axe. Nothing awesome. And the only thing we're really doing really differently and for with our rules, we have a couple of rules that we change, and there's another video that explains my house rules. But just to let you know right off the bat, what we do is we give all our level one characters max health, meaning that if they're a D4, like a monk, they're going to start off with four hit points. If they're a fighter, they're going to start off with 10. So in this case, you can see with his constitution of 18, he gets those extra four hit points for a total of 15. And there's another video that really breaks down my house rules. They're not too offensive for the rules lawyer, but there's some of them are a little bit more streamlined. Uh, like we change the melee round from 60 seconds seconds down to six seconds so therefore we change the movement rate and we'll do that later let's get on with talking about our characters so when in our story what we want to have is this strong you know powerful confident not the not the best leader in the world right just just take a look at his ability scores and, and, and intellect is 10 intelligence is 10 you know and the wisdom is seven so you're talking about a guy with average intelligence he can do math he may not really know how to invest his money maybe he spends too much money on the weekend he's broke on tuesday but he's got 17 dexterity this guy can fight okay i would say that conor mcgregor has 18 dexterity this guy can fight okay he's strong he's really strong Strong as Chael Sonnen, right? He can fight, and he's got great dexterity. His constitution is 18. This guy has heart. He can, I mean, I'm just going to use UFC terms here, right? This guy has incredible heart. I mean, you would be, he would not bring this guy down. He's going to be strong. And because he's a dwarf, dwarfs get all kinds of bonuses to sever their saving throws, like rod staff and wand and spells. See how his number's already down to 11 and 12? That's by the book, rather the DM's guide and the player's handbook, right? And if you've never read those books and you don't know anything that we're talking about, 
look at the links in the description and you can get copies of these PDFs. They're like $9 each. The original version of D&D is so awesome to work with. So Orsta Ulvikson. So he's our guy from the Lort Mills Mountains. Now we'll do another episode that talks about how these characters meet each other. Let's just go to our next character right off the bat. Now another character I thought would be really interesting is a, a real diehard kind of St. Cuthbert slash uh, proper religious female cleric who's tough, who fights, who isn't running around wearing a robe and casting heel. She isn't the mumsy type of girl, but she's, she's young and she's wearing plate mail the best she can. In this situation, she's wearing splint mail and has a kite shield, you know, and she doesn't have the best statistics in the whole world. She's only a 13 wisdom, but she comes from Voluna City. Maybe she's well connected, but her goal in life is to prove herself that she can fight. She's tall. You know, she's not just a sh some short, paltry female, but she's not the strongest. 11 strength, 11 intelligence, 13 wisdom 10 dexterity nine constitution but a lot of charisma and that charisma is going to empower her to be kind of a leadership person when you pair her up with the fighter and there's interactions with npcs or interactions decisions of which hallway to take in a dungeon or what attack should we do first maybe she has a little bit of a way to kind of provide some leadership but maybe her tactical thinking isn't as super strong if you blend um if you blend Orsta, you know, with his high dexterity, his high constitution, his low intellect and his own intelligence, his low wisdom, and you bend it with her, um, Emma Lamore Dreva is what we call her, kind of an Irish name. We just call her Emma for short. You know, she's not the smartest. Those two could make some bad decisions together. So she's got her holy water symbol. You know, she's got vials of holy water, prayer book, and some beads. She's very basic. She's not based on Catholicism or anything, but she's just a good old-fashioned cleric. There's nothing heroic about her at all. And like I mentioned before... Cleric start with a 1d8 hit die. She has no bonus from her constitution, so we just start her off at max hit points. We want to have characters that are survival. They're not going to be facing enemies with max hit points. The enemies are going to use random hit points, just like in the modules in the old days. This is one of the only major changes that we're doing. They're not starting off with a bunch of magic items. They're not powerful. We're going to have to play to their wits. So we had this really great character, this, this strong, uh, charismatic female that has a religious connection. You know, her almost paladin-esque type of vibe and what she does is someone coming from Valuna, the city of Valuna, which is a very noble kingdom you see in the upper left-hand camp. So when things start going wrong and she's sent on a mission, she's the person that's sent on the mission to Hamlet. And perhaps along the way, she's bumping into Orsta and the two of them hook up together and they travel together because maybe there's something happened with Orsta as well and he's headed the same way. So that's our first two characters. Now we got six. So we got four more to go through. The next one, we decided to do something kind of different. We got Seamus Shevlin, the embalmer. There is actually a, if you look on a map of Northern Ireland, there is actually a place. Uh, it's like an, a, a, an embalming shop where someone, you know, someone in your family passes away and you're going to embalm them and have a showing in an open casket and all that kind of stuff. There's actually a Seamus Shevlin a business and it's not doing it, making fun of Seamus Shevlin. It's a great name. I love the name. We're going to lift this awesome real person's name or this business's name and not making fun of them. We're going to use this as a cool name for a character who's a gnome, who's an assassin, who has a huge emphasis on using ingestion and insinuative poison. Now, if you've never read up the cool rules in the Dungeon Master's Guide about ingestive and insinuative poison, you should check them out. They're really great. They're on the DM's Guide, page 20. Um, this is one of the things about the assassin that's really, really cool is they, I don't, ever play them with the you did an assassination off screen like Assassin's Creed Brotherhood type junk. What I like to do is have them use poisons. Now they get to backstab just like a uh, regular thief and they got some gnome abilities. They have some extra saving throws and all these kind of abilities you can see down here like double damage or backstab. But he's level one and let's take a look at his statistics. Strength, you know, 13, above average. He's strong. He's a gnome. He's a little guy. He's strong. Intelligence is pretty high. And to be an assassin, you got to have pretty high. 14 is pretty high intelligence. This guy is not dumb. He may not be the wisest guy in the world. Maybe he makes some risky decisions, but he's average wisdom. He doesn't pull in front of someone in traffic, okay? Pretty good dexterity. 14, that high intellect and that high dexterity together, they make a great combination. His constitution is really high. Even though he's just a little gnome, this guy is really set for speed. He can take the damage. He can take the hits. He's not going to give up. He can hold his breath, and he has a lot of charisma. So this is a really interesting character. So we kind of gave him this kind of wacky, avant-garde, confident, pirate hat wearing flair with his little skulls and his little belts and everything so this guy is very confident so we want his personality to not be the very uh, holy do good prove myself female cleric or the 
I can take a fight, put me in the front line kind of dwarf fighter and give this really intelligent, really smart, let's figure out a way to do this. I mean, his charisma is really high. He'd make a great leader. At the same time, when it comes to tactical combat decisions, he might be the one that has the really good ideas on how to handle the next combat situation. So I thought he'd be a great character because he's going to come from the uh, Cron Hills area. So this is a, a region, as you see here on the left-hand side, that is like 20,000 gnomes live here. So this guy has learned his trade. Maybe he's traveled back and forth of Verbabunk, and he knows how to get around, knows how to do things. So, I mean, he's not a high-level guy. He's still a low level, but he is an assassin, so he knows how to do stuff. He's the only guy in our party that's technically neutral evil. You have to have a little bit of evil to be an assassin in AD&D. &D. And so by him sticking a little bit evil, he's not he's paired up with a chaotic neutral female cleric who's paired up with a lawful neutral dwarf fighter. So we might get a little bit of storyline fiction happening there, but no like crossing arms and I refuse to work with you type stuff, right? We tried to intentionally make sure we didn't have a lot of elf versus dwarf hate going on with our party, right? So next we have this other interesting character, a monk. And I love playing a monk. And I know we're using an elephant easy picture here for my other campaign, but it's and when we're trying to dress up this monk with these kind of cool robes and everything, a level one monk right using a glaive all right and so for her to be a monk you gotta have these great statistics but she's got some really bad ones too so you know the, her name is Rhea Endear uh, and so Rhea is another kind of Irish word we it was originally mean Rhea which is a town but we tried to change it just to Rhea so for Rhea a lot of strength I mean compare her strength to our dwarf fighter Okay, he's at 16 strength. This guy's got a lot of resilience. She's strong. So she's not just some little weakling little girl. She's got strength. And it's much more athleticism than the cleric. Um, more strength than the assassin. You put these two together doing an arm wrestling match, you're going to see some nastiness go down, right? But her intelligence is really low. You know, and we're going to make that like, it's just inexperience. She doesn't have the experience. She hasn't done anything yet. She's maybe young, um, but she's got a lot of wisdom. So she has great judgment. You know, 16 wisdom is fantastic. She has higher wisdom than our cleric. And there's a lot of requirements for monks to have certain types of statistics. And her dexterity is 18. So you compare her to Sheamus. I mean, these two, and even to our dwarf fighter, they have fantastic ability scores for dexterity, constitution, and, uh, and, and strength. So for her, I mean, when it comes to fighting and doing damage and being mobile with her faster movement rate and having the wisdom, the high wisdom, she's going to be a very good tactical person, but her intelligence, we're going to have to be careful with how we play her. We're going to have to make sure that she doesn't. She may have a lot of wisdom, but she doesn't have the experience. And without having the experience, there could be some doubt. Like, so what do you think we should do? It's like, um, well, let's just be really careful, but no real decision about where to go. So that lack of experience is also going to be a lack of confidence. So for Rhea, we're going to try to make sure she has a lack of confidence. And also, because she has such low charisma, she doesn't have a lot of self-esteem. So we're going to try to make her kind of this, uh, I have this great raw talent. I can fight. But I'm not a real good public speaker. Uh, I'm really wise when it comes to fighting. I'm just not really wise to doing things in the real world. So she's the last person you want to have go order a round of beers for everyone, if you know what I mean. She ended up getting in trouble at the bar. Her charisma is really low. So you know, in these situations, we've got this high charisma assassin. Our gnome is high charisma, but he's a short guy. We've got a high charisma um, cleric. Our our, uh, our dwarf and our monk, they, they may work together pretty well. These are like UFC fighters. So using a glaive or her open hand attacks, when her ability to stun as she rolls five, or higher it's going to make a big difference now when you're playing a monk you got to be careful you're not a frontline fighter so she's going to kind of play a little bit like elephanisi we're going to try to imbue some rpg elements into her make sure she acts and tactically plays the way she should by her statistics we're not going to cheat uh, her we're going to try to keep her inexperienced lacking self-confidence but great at fighting Next, we've got a druid, a human druid, Aragol Fahir. So Aragol, you know, we had, we're had we looking through the, 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 the ability scores we rolled up. You're like, we're going to have to have a druid in here. We're just going to have to have it. And we decided to have someone coming from Welkwood because if you remember our storyline from our previous video, um, having someone come from Welkwood is this beautiful redwood forest. They were hugely involved in the great battle. So we decided to pick all our characters. We picked them all as kind of like representatives or a sampling from all the different regions that end up being like this coalition that defeated the Temple of Elemental Evil. So Aragol, you know, 11 strength, that's above average. 13 intelligence, that's not too bad. This guy's not dumb. 14 wisdom, very wise. 12 dexterity, slightly above average. Constitution of 10, 
maybe not the hardiest guy, but that's average. You know, this, this guy can survive in the wilderness because his druid abilities, his wisdom and his druidic abilities. He's not going to sit out in the cold and shiver and freeze to death. He'll be intelligent, know how to take care of himself. So he doesn't have to worry with that. Right. And a lot of charisma. So this is a druid person who's going to be able to interact with their characters, interact with NPCs, interact with people from the old religion that you're going to encounter from Hamlet and maybe even say Cuthbert people. So the ability to navigate the religious and the worldly wise and the travel across landscapes and understanding how what works in the forest and what works in the Cron Hills, that's going to be an interesting dynamic. So the, this druid, we're going to make him a loner. So we may even make a situation where him and Rhea previously worked together doing something. So we may have a situation that even though he was in Welkwood, we may have Rhea and, and Celine, and maybe she meets up with them. We'll see. We haven't written the story yet. I am going to write up a, a story that tells you how all the characters get together. So when we actually start the gameplay in the map. They're entering the Hamlet map. 40 years in the past, and they're already kind of working together. So let's go on to our next character. So besides our human druid, the very last one is we've got this elf wizard. We've named her Liz Fannin Murin, another Irish name. When we rolled those ability scores, I'm sorry to say that we got a four in there. And who else needs the four but the overconfident elf female? <laughs> and we actually rolled random a die. A 50 or higher rolled us the female. So we didn't just all pick girls, right? We just It was just a random die. 50% chance to be a guy, 50% chance to be a female. No, uh, no sexism going on on our table, right? So really low strength, can't carry anything, but really high intelligence. Wisdom is okay, right? Which is kind of like the ability to make judgment calls. Dexterity is pretty darn good and really high charisma. So once again, we're going to have to play to her strengths. So we've decided that she's someone that really scholarly, has a lot of background knowledge, you know, understands the region, um, does sketches, has a leather-bound journal, writes. Um, you know, she has a wine bottle and a silver cup with her. So she's very um, cultured. She comes from Celine. So Instad, which you can see on the map in the background, is a Celine capital. So we're going to have her come from a very refined area that's all about being intelligent, being elegant, and being smart. And as a magic user, because she's a level of magic user, that fits perfect with her. Now, we all know when you're a level of magic user, four hit points doesn't take you very far up against two gobolds. So she's going to have to be careful. So when we get into combat. Let's do a quick summary here of what we have. When we get into combat, we've got a great frontline fighter with good armor class, right? I mean, he's got armor class of zero. We've got a good frontline cleric with armor class of three. We've got a not a very good armor class, but good damage dealer who could hide in shadows, move silently, get a backstab off. There may be situations where you can use this poison skills to change the tide of things. Someone who can open locks. Someone can hear hear noise. Maybe we can't really climb walls because he's a gnome. They get a penalty to climb walls. He's not going to be climbing up and down inside of sheer cliffs. You're not going to see him climbing into the moat house under the cover of darkness. Um, but a monk, you know, her thieving abilities plus the assassin's thieving abilities, great opportunity there. Neither one of them can do read languages, but there can be some nobility. You know, they can do some scouting. So these are DPSers. They're going to come into the fight, the fight after the dwarf and the cleric have engaged we even picked up some miniatures for them and I, I, I don't have them painted yet I'm almost, I'm almost ashamed to show them to you until I get them painted I'll have to make some time to do that when I get some spare time now and we have our druid in the mix too right so we got this melee train frontline fighter frontline dwarf fighter frontline human cleric we got a DPSer and the assassin we got a DPSer and a scout and the monk now we have a druid you know and the druid is some debuff going he's going to speak with animals that's going to tremendously help us when we try to navigate what's going on in the world. Um, a real high wisdom to help make tactical decisions. Ability to do things in the environment outside is really great. Fairy fire is going to give you a plus two to hit. Because if you notice, the roll to hit for the warrior here, our, our fighter, is 20 at AC1, right? It's not 20 at AC0. The cleric actually has the one of the best rolls to hit possible at this level. It's hurt to hit AC0 is only 20. To hit AC0 for the assassin is actually at AC1 it's 20. And AC, it goes 20, 20, 20, and then it skips up higher. For the monk, hit AC 0, she's a 20, a natural 20. For everyone at level 1, it's pretty much hitting AC 0 at 20. But the fighter actually has a worse chance to hit than the cleric. So that's going to be something, and the, and the monk. So I have to play that very, very carefully. So by having the druid, he is going to be able, you know, his armor class isn't great. It's only AC8. This is a guy just wearing leather armor. We decided that he has a wooden shield, but he doesn't want to use it even. So I said, you know what? Let's make sure that our druid isn't thinking he's a frontline fighter. Um, he's not going to be doing a lot of healing. He's going to be helping with other ways, maybe doing some damage with his scimitar. So we're going to be very careful how we play the druid. He may be someone that later on when he gets entangled and stuff, he needs to do crowd control. Um, you know, he can pick up charm 
animal spell and end up having an animal companion with him for a long period of time if there's enough time for them to make friends with a wolf or a bear or something like that. And that could help do some damage for him. So be careful with the druid. This guy will be stronger later. And lastly, with our magic user, I mean charm person. So for her, you know, there's going to be situations where things get nasty. If she can get that charm person landed on an NPC character, because in this campaign that we're going to play, there's going to be a lot of NPC characters, good guys and bad guys. So that's a quick synopsis of what our story is going to be, what our characters are all about, what their backgrounds are. And in our next video, what we're going to do is we're going to show you exactly like how do we go from the original module and break it down? Like is Otis still there? You know, we have retired adventures that aren't there anymore. Um, how does the militia work when there wasn't really a militia? You know, what do we do with some of these buildings that weren't built yet? Like, for example, some of these, the well-kept dwelling and the sign, number 10, which is the wooden sign, the bag of wool and the loom, that wasn't even built yet. You know, there's people that are elderly in the, the T1. They're actually young people in our adventure. Um, we're not trying to remove these buildings because we don't want to do them. We're removing them because they weren't there. Like, for example, even this huge uh, tower being built that's here, that you know who lives there, right? Um, that wasn't even built yet. So all these buildings marked in brown aren't built yet. So in our next video, we're going to talk about, like, how do we go back in time? How do we do the map for this? We're going to take some tracing paper, and we're going to overlay that tracing paper over our map in our next video. In fact, when we start the next video, we'll already have it taped down. And we're going to redraw the whole map and give you a sense of what the village of Hamlet is going to be. Because that's where we're going to start way back in time. And then we'll have a brand new map that we can show you guys and give you PDF copies of for fun if you want to use it in your campaign. So that's going to be our next video. I hope you have fun meeting our ensemble cast of characters. I'm trying to keep these videos shorter and more digestible. And uh, yeah, we'll see what happens. It should be a lot of cool. I'm really excited about it. I think there's a lot of neat opportunities to do some fun, creative things. And if you never get to play D&D &D anymore, you can just hang out with us and, and do it with us, right? So let's see how it goes, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Take care. We'll talk to you later.